It took me 12 nights to figure out what the littlest werewolf wanted from me. I'd stand in the sheep pasture at twilight and glare at her as she crouched in the sagebrush, her unblinking golden eyes tracking my every step. My old sheepdog Zeus would bark and claw in the red dust, agitated and protective, yet too lazy to make the chase. But the wolf never tried to steal a sheep. She never moved at all. At least, not unless I broke her gaze, and looked away for a moment. Then I'd glance back, and she'd be gone, in an instant disappearing into the pinion and juniper trees of the hummingbird hills, that sunless thicket where the less benevolent of the gods were rumored to lurk. I'd stand quietly and listen to her mournful howl bring down the moon, a bewailing that echoed through the canyons and vibrated the dry grass beneath my feet. Kill the white man, seemed to be her lament, carried on the cool night winds. Kill him. Her words confounded me. There were certainly no white men around here. Living in a remote pueblo in the desert canyon lands of northern Arizona, the only white men I ever encountered were the occasional sheriff's deputy or government agent, well-intentioned Mormon missionaries promising a marvelous afterlife, or anthropologists fascinated by our complex pantheon. All of these visitors were politely escorted away. Even still, the presence of the little wolf bedeviled me, for I quickly understood that I was the only one who had yet seen or heard her. A real wolf, Papa? My youngest daughter Ariadne asked me one morning, as I told her and her sisters the story over breakfast. Or a creature quite like it, I said, finishing my cereal with one hand, stirring sugar into my coffee with the other. I reckon there's a breath of something primate and conscious in there. What makes you think she's not all wolf? My middle daughter Antia asked. She crouches in the same place every day and never looks at the sheep. She watches me alone, with the saddest of eyes. Her ears flick at the sound of my voice, and her own howl is unusually expressive and forlorn. But a human can't howl. My oldest daughter Arachne declared. Maybe she's a god in disguise, I said, winking at her. Or their half-human child. The daughter of a wolf god, born to a human mother who feared it so much she abandoned it in the desert to die. My wife Leah suddenly dropped her coffee mug. It shattered on the floor, and I turned in surprise. I hadn't noticed her there, standing at the stove, listening to the conversation. What do you think it is, Mama? Auntie asked her, unconcerned. Leah shrugged and took a sip of her coffee from the mug in her hands. I looked but saw no broken mug. I blinked, figuring I'd only imagine the loud smash and the fragmented splinters of earthenware. Isn't the Fish and Wildlife Service reintroducing grey wolves around here? She said. They're trying to clear the overpopulation of deer at the Grand Canyon. Maybe one of those wolves wandered across. Maybe, I agreed. But this one speaks to me, I think. Just like Auntie Cassandra, Ariadne said. She hears the wind speak to her in human words. It makes her twitch and falls down asleep, and behind her eyes, she sees the faces of the gods who make the wind. Cassandra's mind is very ill, Leah said. Leave her alone, and leave the wolf alone. If it is a god, it's best not to meddle in whatever task it must complete. Would anyone like some coffee? The brewer steamed and hissed. The radio buzzed and hummed the morning news and the weather reports. I had to admit, I couldn't dispute my wife's assertion. But I didn't want to believe it. I couldn't get the narrative out of my head, of the little cub with a mortal mother and a divine father, a child with an uncanny inclination towards turning canine when the moon rose in the sky. It brought a little spark of a thrill to the slow turn of life, 
the life of society's outliers, out among the barren rust-colored desert. Letting my imagination run wild, I thought of my son, somewhere far from home, being cared for by the spider god who called him her beloved. I gazed at my daughters, young and vulnerable, yet so untamed and wild. I thought of the human mother who might, at this moment, be wondering where her little half-divine wolf cub was huddling, imagining her child lost among the old trees and the voices of the night. Was she scared? Was she hungry? Was she shivering with cold in these crisp autumn evenings after the sun went down, yearning for the familiar warmth of home? I loved my own children more than anything. I understood that primal, animalistic urge to protect one's defenseless offspring. My heart softened towards the staring and unmoving cub. Her origins were an enigma to me, but, were she my own daughter, I'd certainly hope another parent would be there to keep a vigilant eye on her and listen to her unspoken desires. The next evening, I began to bring small scraps of mutton and elk jerky to the wolf girl. She'd cower if I walked too close, pulling back her lips to show me her gleaming white fangs. Kill the white man, she rasped, in a voice like radio static. First you must eat, I whispered affectionately. Then you may kill whatever ghosts you happen to find. I was often close enough to smell her, only briefly. She carried the sweet scent of burning sagebrush and tobacco in her fur. Once, I thought I saw a single tiny, glistening tear emerge from her sunken eye and roll down her snout. Kill him, she howled from afar. Kill what man? I asked. There is no white man here. Only me, and I'm the only one who knows you're here. Why won't you let me help you? She stared, silent as ever, but she did not run from me that evening. Encouraged by her sprouting interest in being nurtured, I turned up a few old baby blankets. Within their folds, I tucked bits of fragrant lavender and soothing catnip. I left them under a pinion tree near the border to the dense forest of the hummingbird hills. I'd taken care of her hunger and her shivering. All I could do now was try to heal her loneliness, to take her somewhere warm and inviting, and reunite her with the family from whom she surely must have been forced to depart. But that was not to be. On the twelfth day, I was paid a visit by a deputy of the county sheriff. I was spending a lazy autumn day in the kitchen garden, checking the tall stalks of blue corn for ripeness, pulling back the husks to get a swift glimpse of their deep indigo kernels, their rare beauty is hidden and lustrous as a dragon's cache of jewels. For a moment I imagined myself the hero of that story, slaying the dragon and stealing its bounty. He didn't see me watching him as he drove up the winding road that spiraled around the mesa on which our pueblo was perched. His clunky white pickup truck rumbled and roared across the ancient bridge of bones that connected Mercury Mesa to Jupiter Mesa, and followed the dusty red road to where I stood, a fat husk gripped too tightly in my hands. Deputy Babbitt got out of the truck and faced me, covering the gun on his hip, watching my hands, avoiding my eyes. Babbitt didn't much care for people like me. We didn't much care for deputies. Sir, he nodded, trying to look casual in a place so backward and foreign to a white man. He swept off his sun-bleached cowboy hat and leaned against the hood of the truck, stubbing out his cigarette with his pale leather boot. How's everything going around the farm? How's your wife and that beehive of daughters? I looked over my shoulder to make sure my family was safe inside the house. I remembered then that Leah had taken the children along to see the traveling carnival in Canab. Zeus was probably asleep in the sheep pasture. Mr. Beartooth, Babbitt said when I didn't answer. I've heard a rumor that you've spotted a wolf nearby, one that's stalking your sheep and eating your food. 
rumor? I said. Gossip, certainly. There haven't been wolves around here for fifty years. You ought to know that. Who told you I'd seen a wolf? Cassandra Maldonado. She won't speak to me, but I heard her young daughter's gone missing, and I believe the girl may have been dragged away by the wolf your kids are telling everyone about. Poor Cassandra. Her daughter was all she'd had. But if there was anyone who craved utter solitude, it was Cassandra. She lived a hermetical life on the dusty outskirts of the Pueblo, with only her cows for company, and we all assumed that's the way she wanted it. I myself had always been uneasy around her, never sure what to say or where to look when I'd bring her gifts of surplus peaches, and she'd begin to yelp and swear and convulse. But we all avoided her, back then. We told ourselves it was what she needed. I was vaguely sorry to hear her child was missing. I'd forgotten she had a child. I turned my back on the sheriff's deputy, and back to my corn. I've told you all I know, I said to him, my fingers idly digging at the brittle husks, not knowing even what they were doing. I hoped he wouldn't see my hands shaking. I think it's time for you to leave, deputy. Babbitt was quiet for a long moment. Well, I have the feeling there's something else you're not telling me, he said, his voice as low and discordant as a rattlesnake's tail. I clenched my jaw. I waited. I opened and closed a corn husk, again and again, entwining my fingers in the gossamer green tassel, feeling the taut bulge of milk beneath the swollen kernels. I glanced at the garden shears on the opposite side of the garden, imagining the crunch they'd make as they sheared off the man's nicotine-stained fingers. There was a sound of a door opening and closing. I turned around again. Deputy Babbitt was dragging a brownish-gray bundle from the bed of his truck. His hands and his white jacket were stained with its blood. I knew right away what I was seeing. Its fur was matted and dirt clogged. Its caved inside was stained with a rust-colored smudge. Its tongue hung out of a mangled snout, and its amber eyes stared straight ahead, into my own eyes, as they always had, never breaking that line of sight. Babbitt dropped it heavily on the ground and finally stared at me forthright. Don't you ever lie to me like that again, he hissed into my face. I've just done you a favor by shooting this dangerous animal, and now I expect to be thanked, not deceived. I put my life in danger for your flock, for your wife, for your children. You don't have to like me, but you do have to respect me. That's all I ask. There are worse predators out there than this one, and you have no idea what I've done for you to let you let you people quarantine yourselves up here without interference. My family has lived in Arizona for a century, civilizing this barren dust bowl, trying to guide your people into the modern world, and all we get back from you is suspicion and scruple. Now, don't you dare take my protection for granted, and ruin it for the ones that want progress and improvement? Don't you dare violate that tenuous trust I've been generous enough to give, even as I overlook your flaws. Don't you dare? I glared, straight ahead, our faces so close I could smell the remains of his cigarette in his white moustache. I did not sever my gaze with his. I thought of the littlest werewolf, speaking through the silence, pleading with her eyes. He couldn't hold for long. He kicked the wolf's body with his white boot. So that's all you've got? He growled. No thanks. No gratitude? Does this dead menace mean nothing to you? You are nothing to me, I said. One day you, too, will lie in the sand, but you won't get a burial nearly as grand as hers. Your mouth will fill with dust and cornmeal. Your tongue will be replaced by a scorpion's tail. Your eye sockets will be the nursery for a rattlesnake's eggs. Your ribs will be made hollow by the sun, 
and will whine in the wind like a bone flute. Is that a threat, he said, backing away, or a curse? Neither, I said. It's an expectation. An aspiration. An invocation. He gritted his teeth. Then he turned, smashed his hat back onto his head, and got into his truck. I waited for him to cross the bone bridge before I turned and crouched at the side of the little wolf girl, another father's daughter, my pollen-covered fingers stroking her ears, still soft, still listening to words carried on a wind that blew from another world, the land of the dead. I lay there until the sunset. Then I carried her down the mesa and buried her at the edge of the sheep pasture the place where I'd first seen her, waiting, quietly begging me to listen to her wolf words. I smudged her nose and forehead with all the corn pollen remaining on my hands, as one does to both the newly dead and the newly born, as I had done to all my children, and later to my father. Zeus watched for a while, sitting on his haunches before he finally let out a low, ululating howl that echoed off the hills and resonated through the canyons and reverberated in the craters of the luminous silver moon. He led me back home, where Leah and the children had already gone to bed. In the night, I woke, feeling as if I'd heard my name whispered in a dream. I rolled over to watch the moon out the window. But the clouds had gathered, covering it in a pearlescent shroud. Hephaestus, a voice called to me into the stillness and the holy dark, a voice that sounded like Cassandra's. Hephaestus, she was pregnant. Too young to be, I said, and could not contain my tears. She was only thirteen. Too young, I said again, too gentle to endure. I sat straight up. Was she? Was she born human? not a wolf. Fully human, Cassandra whispered. Deeply loved. Who transformed her? The voice was silent. I looked down at Leah, asleep next to me, untroubled by the whispers. I wondered if I had only dreamt the conversation. For immediately it was lost in the haze of linear time, just like the coffee mug that had never shattered. Soon I too slept again, a restless doze that allowed my mind to walk barefoot across the desert sands, leaving no footprints, wandering under a swiftly spinning sky whose stars had no names. The following morning, I found the body of Deputy Babbitt at the far end of the sheep pasture. He had been scalped, flayed, and disemboweled, his entrails making spirals and curlicues in the dust. His throat had been torn out, left in bloody tatters of oozing, putrefying shreds of flesh. His genitals had been torn almost completely from his body, left dangling and mangled. His toenails and fingernails had been yanked out of their bleeding cuticles. His mouth, open in an eternal scream of agony, was stuffed with dried sagebrush and cactus thorns. His ribcage, splayed open to reveal a half-eaten heart and lungs, made a wailing, keening noise that swelled and receded with the icy wind. I looked at my fingertips, again dusted with corn pollen. Then I wiped my hands on my jeans and did not touch the dead man's forehead. From afar, I felt myself being watched. I turned. Watching me from the other side of the fence was an enormous wolf with green eyes that wept human tears. Its fur was black all over, like a person in mourning. It gazed at me not with fear or caution, as the young one had, but with attentive rage. Who are you? I asked, holding its gaze, my hand on the hunting knife at my hip. It ought to be your wife lying there in the dirt. Rotting alongside the man, said the black wolf, in a voice like the whispers I had heard in the clouded night. Your dispute is not with Leah, I said. She's done nothing wrong. Leah never asked my permission to transform my daughter, said the black wolf. 
She acted hastily, and by the time I found out what happened, she could not undo what she had done. My Ida didn't have to die. She didn't have to suffer in the cold night, alone and starving, wondering why this perversion had been put upon her. I don't understand, I said. I loved my daughter. I loved her. She was all I had. I would have loved her baby, in a way that nobody in this desert ever loved me. You've all rejected and abandoned me, forced me to live far away from everyone. You hated Ida for her slow mind and slow speech. You hated me for the way I twitched and fainted. Yet still, I had no desire to be a wolf. Magic in the hands of one with an unsound mind is perilous. But when the deputy came around, talking rumors about my Ida, I transformed myself anyway, to be close to my little one forever. And now it's too late. You've all killed her. The black wolf stepped closer to me. Leah stole something from me, in more ways than one. She stole it to carry out her private vengeance on the white man. But my own vengeance is not complete. Warn your wife that when I see her again, I will tear her apart, piece by piece. I will prolong her suffering for years, as I replace her human body with this wolf's body. I refuse to become human again until I've been satisfied. Then she stood on her hind legs, becoming as tall and straight-backed as the tallest human. She bolted into the overgrown woods of the Hummingbird Hills, to where the sun refused to shine. I confronted Leah that night by the fireplace. Don't keep secrets from me like that, I said, softly, restraining my impatience, my indignation. I had every right, she said. It's not the first, and won't be the last. Why, Leah? Why did you turn Ida into a wolf? You're not a shaman or a witch. You have no right to be using magic against a child. Why would you do something so contemptible? Leah was listening to a record of bark violin sonatas while she drank watermelon wine straight from the bottle. Its sweet smell could not overtake the steely scent of blood that saturated the room. She set it down, hard, on the wooden floor and looked me straight in the eye. I was protecting Idaho when Cassandra showed me the black moth encased in amber, a gift she'd claimed to have been given by the wolf god White Paws, she swore it would turn me into a wolf. I could finally kill Babbitt with no consequences, as I had wanted to do for so long. But I found that I couldn't. I had too much to lose. I have a home, and children, and a job. Instead, when I saw Ida was pregnant, I gave the piece of amber to her and changed her into a wolf. I forbade her from telling her mother, and I sent her out into the desert to hunt that lowlife scum. Protecting her? From what? You seemed to have tied and not even you cannot untangle. I told you. Ida was pregnant. Who do you think was the father of her child? And who do you think is Ida's father, too? The deputy, I said, suddenly feeling small and simple for not making the connection until now. Ida had always been more light-skinned than the rest of us, and we had mistrusted her because of it. What an abomination, for a man to beget a child one his own daughter. I gave Ida a gift. Leah continued. The gift of carrying out vengeance. The only gift I could give that would match the generosity of a wolf god. I would have wanted that privilege for myself, years ago. I was younger than she when Babbitt raped me, and my rage had a knife's edge. I raged because I was powerless. And his power is so unbounded, that he killed Ida anyway, not to protect himself from the accusation, but because he could. Eventually he would have found some other girl to victimize, and then what would we do? Turn all our girls into a colony of bats? Would you want to see your own daughters hanging upside down in a cave all day, unable to live a beautiful life in the sunshine? I admit I used magic that did not belong to me, 
and which I had no right to try to control. But you need to understand that I only intended to protect the girl. I told Ida she must be the one to slay Babbitt, to force him to look into her eyes in the moment of his death, to regret his actions, to understand that the consequences were finally catching up with him. And once he was dead, I promised Ida, I would find a way to make her human again. She never had the heart to kill him, I said. Too gentle a soul, abused until she had no will of her own. Too meek to stain her teeth with blood. Her blood is on your hands. Hephaestus, Leah said, again changing the subject, what about your owl? Ida was begging you to kill the deputy. The white man. The white man in the white truck with the white hat and the white boots. Why didn't you do it, once you saw that she had failed to take him down? He was here, the day she was shot. You didn't tell me. But I could smell his scent all over the ground when I arrived home. Nobody would have seen you cut his throat. Nobody would have known. The gods would have devoured the body and protected you from the consequences, that you asked. Why didn't you avenge me, avenge Ida? avenge all his past and future victims. Why didn't you listen to her cries? You overlooked her human desires and ignored what she was saying with her human voice. You treated her like some spoiled household dog who only wants a bed and a belly rub. Don't lay the burden of shame on me, I said. You misled me. You told me she was an ordinary wolf, and to leave her alone. How could I have known Ida would fail? Clearly, I'm not as clever or powerful as you think me to be. Leah scowled. A child is dead, she said, and all you care about is shifting the blame to anyone but yourself. You sound an awful lot like Babbitt right now. You're wrong, I fumed. I have been humbled, Leah, and I believe you are the merciless one. You used magic stolen from a vulnerable mother, and left a little girl in a body she didn't want. You forced a child to fight your battle, and now Cassandra will be forever stalking you. She has her canine stare fixed on you, on your every move. One day, she'll pounce, and take her revenge on you, and she will tear you apart piece by piece, year after year and replace your body with a wolf's. And I will never be powerful enough to protect you. I can't. The blanket around her shoulders fell. She quickly pulled it back up, but not before I saw a flash of the grey-brown of a wolf's furry foreleg, hastily stitched onto the bleeding stump of her elbow with greasy sinew. I looked up from the fresh wound. I met her eyes. She glared back at me, eyes fiery. But I could not hold her gaze. I bent my head, and I hid my face in my hands.